I think I spotted Eldon, so that's a good start. Yeah, that's <laughs> always a good start. I'm a speaker. You you might not you might not say that at the end. <laughs> <laughs> One advantage of Zoom is you can quietly switch off without anybody noticing. <laughs> go and go and do the dishes and things. Oh yeah. Mm. Just don't go to sleep. That's all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I had a quick look at the uh, YouTube, and uh, there's been a good number of people visiting that. There's, there's been 30 odd people looked at the World War I uh, video, and there's been over 100 have looked at the Grangemouth old photographs. So obviously that's that's been a big wow. uh, a big catch on on YouTube. Well, I hope the 50 who aren't members have paid their subscription. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna have to. <laughs> Either that. Somebody's been watching it over and over and over again. Morning, Eldon. Hello. Hello. Who said Walwin. that? Walwin. Walwin. Where's Walwin? I'm here. Oh I, oh, I see it. You've got a blank screen. That name came up, but then a blank screen. <laughs> Upper left-hand corner. Or oh, my screen, anyway. Yes, we, we can't see Walwin. I'm not quite sure why. But, I don't uh, know why. I'm, 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 my light is on the screen. It shows I'm... I'm not muted or anything, so I should be, I should be seen. <coughs> yeah, I can, it doesn't matter. I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you one thing: if if Warren were to turn his his camera around to see what his view is, I think we'd all just start, couldn't see a thing because of the tears. He's got one of the views that absolutely to die for. It's lovely, We're beautiful. So good, Warren. You keep that screen like that. <laughs> so where, whereabouts is that, Wallen? Where are you? Bermuda. 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 Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. A nice part of the world. Morning, Bruce. Uh, Good morning. The, the Caribbean just after the hurricane, and, and uh, we, I think we were the first cruise ship in after the hurricane, uh, and uh, it's a lovely part of the world. Yeah. Hello, Bruce. Good morning. Good morning, all. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Hi, Bruce. Nice, nicer morning than it's been. Uh, yesterday wasn't too good. It was not. I was so depressed I had to have two whiskies in the evening. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> That's bottles, I take it. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> good morning, John Lewis. How are you? Good morning to you, Bruce. Yeah, have you been up to see the garden again? Uh, not since we last spoke, no. All right. But I told you my find round the side of the garden summed up my life at the moment. A dead rabbit full of maggots and a champagne yeah. cork from Moy et Chandon. <laughs> I thought that's it. It's not bad, is it? <laughs> well, is it, the, the tragedy is that you only found the cork. <laughs> morning. Morning, David. Good morning. Oh, hi, David. Hi. Well, just, just saying, when, when we put your uh, Grangemouth photographs onto YouTube, They've had over 170 people look at them. Oh gosh, that's embarrassing. Thank you, Josh. Morning, Joe. Hello. Morning. Do you know where these people are from? No, I'm afraid not. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Bill. How are you? I'm fine, there, Joe. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey, oh, no. I mean, uh, hello, Tony. No <laughs> helmets this morning. <laughs> No. <laughs> His face masks. <laughs> oh, I had one many years ago with a gas mask. Got my Oh. There you <laughs> my computer's got antivirus. Uh, <laughs> you're all right. <laughs> right. Good enough. <laughs> I'm <all> hard. <laughs> yeah, when they say a meeting's gone viral, that there's a new meaning again, eh? <laughs> yeah. no. We've got a blank bit in the middle up at the top there. W A L Y N. Wow. That's what it went. His, his video's not working properly. Or ah. is... Morning, Dave. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Good morning, chaps. Turn the sound up a bit. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Morning, Douglas. Here we go. You're in. Hello, Chris. Nice to see morning, you. Guys. Morning. Well, mate, you're not getting any collection for your coffees, are you? Free coffees we get now. <laughs> <laughs> the, the biscuits we want as well. Aye. 
Oh, that's right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome to, I can't remember, This is, is this the third or fourth, I think, of our online Zoom meetings? Uh, they seem to be successful. Uh, don't sure you were all uh, listening at the beginning when John said that we've now had uh, a lot, uh, 100, I think, for the Grangemouth meeting on YouTube hits, if that's the right word to use, and 30 for so far for Joe's talk last week. Uh, I, I guess we'll see how it goes in the future. It looks as though at least those members who aren't on Zoom and have IT are actually getting a chance to see what we've been up to. Um, and it looks as if we might be drumming up um, interest from people who aren't members, either that or when somebody looked at them once, they like it so much they look again, which is, can't be a bad thing either. There's no real news, I don't think, this week in terms of, I haven't really actually had much of a chance to phone around people uh, the last few weeks. So without further ado, I'll go move on to our very own uh, Scottish version of Alan Bennett, that well-known talking head, Eldon Zuell, who's going to, I think, talk about himself, which is probably something he So, Eldon, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for volunteering to do this. And <laughs> Eldon Zuell, talking head. Anyway, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Um, maybe I should start with the old introduction that if you can't, uh, can't hear me at the back, you know, um, then some wag will come up and say, yes, I, I can hear you at the back, but I can lovely to change places with anyone who can't. So I don't know whether this is going to be actually a part of the Zoom experience where, you know, at the end of the meeting, I um, suddenly look at my screen and bang, there's nobody there. They've all gone to coffee. So I'm going to try and um, sort of see if I can, I can do this. I, I, I've... Uh, clicked on and there's John Adams in full view, huge and, and very attractive with a wonderful Sterling Castle in the background, I think. I'm not terribly sure. Um, but that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of go through the, um, my, my raison d'etre for being here. And this is date blog, July 2020, during the coronavirus lockdown. Don't let the facts or the truth spoil a good story. In the past couple of years and, and in the last couple of months, I've had a lot of fun in trying to um, get the, uh, my, my life in order. I don't know why I've sort of felt that. Maybe it's to do with old age or something, but you know, getting the idea of life in order. And uh, I was sitting down the other day and I was just thinking, well, you know, my whole life has been one of storytelling. When I was a school teacher, I um, had a lot of fun with the uh, aspects to do with um, entertaining classes. When I left teaching, one of the senior pupils came up to me and said, you know, Mr. Zool, we're really going to miss you. And I thought, oh, here it comes now, my wonderful aspects of all the knowledge that I've imparted. He said, no, we're going to miss your stories. You, you really gave us so many stories during the lesson. We're going to miss your storytelling. So the idea of storytelling was born as far as an educational thing um, came. The other day I was looking at my, um, uh, my uh, eye paper. I get one of these papers at 4 a.m. in the morning and suddenly – uh, can can read all the latest news at about nine o'clock when I finally wake up. But these um, aspects to do with storytelling have appeared quite regularly in the newspaper. And so I just want to touch, and it was just one edition I actually looked at to look at storytelling. And so when the facts is, so when the advice is chaotic and the messengers are habitual storytellers, you might as well say, sod it and go to the beach. And this was an article on the factual advice being given by the experts during this COVID-19 lockdown. Later on, there was a recently to be published book, Notification, The Art of Political Storytelling by Philip Sargent, a senior lecturer in the Open University specializing in political fact, language, and social media. And there's a lot of books being produced at the moment, which are looking at the political scene, both here and across the pond, of course. 
um, and in New Zealand. And anywhere you want to look, this Brazil, there's a tremendous amount of political storytelling going on. And then there was a couple of book reviews, um, recent books that have been published. One was written by Gavandra Hodge, The Consequences of Love. And the reviewer was saying Hodge is a masterful writer with a gift for storytelling and went on about how she uses all her experience about um, t telling about the consequences of love. And then there was another one written called Short Stories, which I thought, right, in this there'll be something about storytelling. And yes, there certainly was, because Riva is a masterful storyteller, very skillful in delivering her material. And so on it went. Now, I want to illustrate the idea of storytelling with just two from my experience. I was very fortunate to get a post at uh, the Animal Behavior Research Group at Oxford University in 1967. And I went up to um, the group and joined it and started uh, looking around for some aspects of research. And um, one day the secretary came in and said, um, Eldon, we need somebody to go along to the Women's Institute to um, give a talk about the animal behavior, something like that. And, and so I said, oh, I'll, I'll do that. I'd love, love to do that. And, uh, what do you want me to talk? And she said, no, choose the subject. So I'd been at a meeting in uh, Rennes in France a couple of months ago, and I was waiting in a coffee line. And in another coffee line, I spotted what I assumed, what I thought was a Trimmingham's coat. Now, one, when you want to realize what a Trimmingham's coat is, but anyone who's, the Trimmingham's no long, long since um, stopped its trading, but it was a very stylish blue, very fine herringbone coat, very distinctive. And I recognized this and I thought, good Lord, that guy's obviously been to Bermuda. So I went off and said, excuse me, is that a Trimmingham's coat? And he said, yes. And it turned out his name was Roger Payne. And Roger Payne was an expert in whale communication. So we had a chat and whatnot, and he went off, and I went off, and whatnot. And I thought, this would be the way I would like to deliver my talk to the WI, WI on whale communication. So I did that, and uh, we had a lot of fun in, in developing that talk. And when I went along to the afternoon, I was only supposed to talk for about 20 minutes. I went along, and the, the um, chair lady, chair person said, now, I have to warn you because in the front row, there's a, um, our patron is in and he was in the second world war and he lost a leg in the second world war and he's got a wooden one. He bunks it up on a stool and uh, he'll, he'll fall asleep and the leg will fall off the stool when you give your talk. It happens in every speech he's ever done. He just, that's what he does. So I thought, oh God, this is going to be interesting. Luckily I had my speech all written out word perfect. And I thought all I have to do is read it when he falls asleep, don't take any offense. When his leg falls off the stool, don't take any offense. Everything will be fine. So I got up to give my, my speech, got my, my talk. And I was standing at the lectern, and I couldn't see him because the lectern was right in front of me. So therefore, I couldn't see over the lectern and see him. Couldn't see him at all. So I delivered my speech, and I was waiting for the snore, or I was waiting for the leg to fall off the stool. Nothing. So I finished my speech and the chair lady came up and said, chairwoman came up and said, oh, what, what, thank you very much. That was very, very nice. Um, and you know, his leg never fell off the stool. He never woke up. And I thought that is a real accolade of a sort of underhanded compliment that I, my speech was so boring that the guy never woke up even in the speech. So therefore, that was the first story, right? Now, the second story is a little bit... Um, more that I, I, I understand because I have evidence for it. Um, my supervisor and I went down to the University of Sussex in Brighton and gave a talk on the research we were doing. And it was, uh, I'm quite sure you're all familiar with this sort of research that we did in those days. It was the heterotic behavior of a lethal gene in the um, male courtship behavior of Drosophila melagaster. I'm quite sure you were familiar with that sort of research. Anyway, we were down there and uh, gave a little 25 minute, 30 minute talk came back to Oxford, no problem at all. About three months later, the secretary again called me into her office. And I thought, oh, God, what's this all about? And she said, do you realize that you and your supervisor have appeared in Punch? And I said, Punch? Punch the magazine? She said, yeah, here's a copy. And she showed me a copy. And sure enough, there was a cartoon 
by Thelwell. Now, I don't know if you know Thelwell's cartoons. He did little bouncing horses and little dogs and, and all these sorts of things. A wonderful cartoonist. And sure enough, there was my supervisor standing with her pointed glasses, quite a shapely woman, Stella Crosley, standing there, and me, rather rotund, rather good, poured over a binocular microscope with the legend underneath or the caption underneath, oh my goodness, she's fended him off again. Now, those of you that are familiar with Drosophila melanogaster um, animal behavior, courtship behavior, know that a female only mates once. It's a fly, a little tiny fly. Female only mates once. And if a subsequent male comes along to try and get it on with her, she uses a, one, a middle leg, back leg, and gives him a real bash in the head, and he goes away. Very good behavior. But this is the fending off behavior of melanogaster. So he must have been based on some talk that he'd read about at the University of Sussex, because he lives near Sussex. Well, the illustration of these two stories are such. The first one, the timing is completely wrong because my wife assures me that she was present at the WRI talk. Now, we were married in 19, December 1969, and so the talk must have been after that date. So I thought I was invited to the Oxford meeting early on in my career. Couldn't it be possible? So don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. The timing was at least two and a half years out. And the second one about Thelwell's cartoon was we never got definitive proof that he actually knew anything about this talk that we gave to the University of Sussex. So these two things are such that storytelling is bound to be involved in uh, man managing, manipulating, massaging the facts. And uh, I, I, I have to be very careful when I when I sort of give a talk, that I, I try and make that evident to everyone that I'm a storyteller. And when I was growing up, my mom and dad said, you're telling stories, Eldon, you're telling stories again. And this was in, in telling me that I was telling lies. I was, I was not telling the truth. And that's a, a, dreadful, a dreadful accusation to make, but one that I wear because don't let facts, don't let uh, truth get in the way of a good story. Now, where am I leading? Well, I'm leading to my missionary zeal statement. I am absolutely committed to having everybody follow me in this quest. And the quest started in 2012, I think, here again. Oh, we're getting in the way of facts. 2012. We took the family away for a, a visit up to Calendar, and we were um, at there. And I couldn't go swimming in the swimming pool. It's a very small swimming pool there because I had an operation. I was recovering from an operation on my leg. And I couldn't get it wet and obviously all that sort of stuff. And I was sitting there one afternoon with my daughter-in-law and we were talking and I was, well, sorry, we were talking. I was talking and she was listening and I was telling her stories about my life and my parents' life in Bermuda and all that. And she said, you know, Eldon, what I'd like you to do is to write this down because obviously uh, Layla and Harry will get a secondhand version from me, which won't be at all accurate and won't be at all true. And Allison's three kids, maybe they don't, weren't here, they were off swimming. They won't hear all these stories. So when I got back home, I decided I was going to write my life history because I'd made the promise to Malena that I would do that. So I sat down and started in. And I tell you, it is a ball. It's a, the best thing I think I've ever done, other than get married and have two children, of course. I mean, I love my, you know, all these sort of, it is, I got addicted to it. I got absolutely addicted to it. And so I found a whole bunch of um, letters and, and diaries from my mother. I read very little from my father. My father was quite an interesting man in that he was self-made. He left school at 14 joined a, a liquor firm in, in Hamilton, Bermuda, as a messenger boy, then, be, then went up through the ranks with the telephone company and became secretary of the telephone company. Fascinating rags to riches type story. Anyway, um, not rags to riches, but necessarily from, uh, you know, leaving school at 14 to being in charge of the Bermuda Telephone Company at, at, uh, as he retired from. 
So the idea was I started on this and I did my father as much as I could remember, spoke to my sister about it, got as much information as good. Then did my mother, all her diaries and letters, very easy to do. Then I started on me. And this was a real tragedy because the amount of information and the amount of misinformation that I was able to dredge up from my memory was something. So 175 pages later, and gentlemen, if you like, that this is the, what the evidence, I don't know whether you'll be able to see that. Uh, where's the camera? Is that, is that there? And I, can you see that? And it's, it's the, the title is, Where is All the Blonde Hair Gone? And that, it, oh, sorry, that's the one. I'm sorry, that's the one. There's the one we want. That's the one. Where, <laughs> where's all the blonde hair gone? And that is um, 100, what is it, 169 pages of fairly close typed um, stories about my mother, father, and me. I produced it very inexpensively. You get 15 copies for 100 pounds. I think it's very inexpensive, less than five or, well, six pounds a copy, sort of thing you want to do. Shared it to my family. Nods of approval, of course. And my son, who's a, a, a school teacher, a, a religious education and moral, he said, Dad, that's fine. That's absolutely a timeline of your life. But what you want to do is to write all the interesting bits, not just where you went to school or what you did and, and you know, what, what games of cricket you played and all this sort of stuff. Write all the other bits. So then I produced that. Now, that is the et cetera of E, 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 Zool. And in it are all the ideas of, of um, I, I mean, you know, the future. I, I, I read it last night. I just looked through it last night. And there was things there that I had forgotten I'd even written. Um, aspects to do with uh, looking at woodworking. I was a hopeless. I built things in the house which fell down. I was, it was great fun though. And uh, woodworking I did. Um, the idea of visits to various um, uh, parts in, in Scotland when I was a national development officer for health studies uh, with the um, exam board. Little things that I'd forgotten, but they're in the book. Now, that's two. The third one is definitely in the making. There's no question about it. The Zoom, the COVID virus, the um, aspects to do with moving house, these are all going to be very, because I'm, I'm on it. I'm on it now. My memory is sharp. I can do it now. Now, this is the zeal. Everybody, I want you to go away after today's meeting and I'll look for homework. I'll be, you know, the school teacher in me will always be there. Look for homework. <laughs> And now I know many of you are probably already doing this. That's the beauty of it. I'm speaking to the converted. I know Wallen's doing it. Um, yesterday I was on a, on a friend to, uh, I used to work with, and he's just completed his uh, memoirs, 36,000 words of it, and he's called it Tall's Tales and Short Stories. Now, those of you Billy Connolly fans know that his recent book, his autobiography called Tall Stories and, sorry, Tall Tales and We Stories. Now that's Billy Connolly's um, one. So this is the thing, you want to go and do this. And, and it's, it's great fun. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a pledge to anyone that wants to. I will, if you contact me, I will very um, send you back all the information you need to know of how to do it. Of course, this is just for my benefit because I love doing it. Whether you're, you're, you get it and you do anything with it, that's up to you. Very similar to my pupils at school. I used to give them all this wonderful information and stuff. Would they do it? Would they pass the exams? Well, some of them did, luckily, so I kept my job for a little bit. Now, um, I want to just, just conclude with three little things. And the three things I'm going to do is, one, the, the second one I'm going to do is for Joe, because I think, Joe, you'd be interested in this. But the first one is from a... Uh, book that my, um, my uncle Warner has produced, and he died a few years ago, but he produced it. It's called Pebbles from the Paths Behind. The striking exception of this general level of competence was Eugene Harrison, a G2 
who succeeded General Allen as my superior. He was a cavalryman and had ridden in some bygone Olympic. He was fearless. I once tried to get him to move away from a window when a German plane was putting up a display during the Battle of the Bulge by machine gunning the wall containing the window. He refused as beneath his dignity and continued with his account of the old time cavalry. He also had the attention span to be expected of a four year old. Now I have read that, I merely read that simply because be very careful of what you write because uh, if you're a bit too scathing about people who know you and people who are still living, you might get that. Now, Joe, this is just for you. This is um, a wonderful book, and I'd, I'd like to let you have a look at this if you like. And it's called A Family Narrative by Harriet Watlington, which had, there's a link actually with the first story I told, because um, uh, Roger Payne, when he worked in Bermuda, worked with a guy called Hartley Watlington, who actually developed sonar devices for uh, listening underwater. And that's how you can record whale songs by listening underwater. And this is a narrative, a, a family narrative, and it has a whole series of letters from the First World War. And one, I just, I wanted to have a look at the 2nd of July because it's, today has been the 2nd of July and um, couldn't, there, there was one or two, but there was one on the 1st of July, which was the um, Battle of the Somme. I think the anniversary, Joe, you told us of the Battle of the Somme. And there was one here, which I thought was really quite, quite amazing, if I can, if I can just find it. And um, they, it, it was one of these things, just, just a few lines to let you know how I'm getting on. I'm writing this from, oh no, it's writing it from the hospital. That's not the one. Oh dear. This is, this is a, you know, obviously well-planned narrative, this is. Um, and he, went to war um, and he was in the uh, ninth brigade of the third division of the British expeditionary forces in, um, in, in uh, all over the place in, in France. And he produced a wonderful series of letters. We have just arrived just behind the firing line. We can hear the guns and see the shells at night. And yet one can hardly believe yet that there was a war on. Of course, it is very interesting to hear the guns and see the shells at night. Airplanes sail overhead all day long, and you may see the anti-aircraft gun shells bursting around them. Oh, it's all very fascinating. Of course, as you see by the address on the letter, we are the first lengths, and of course you know roughly where we are, in one of the hottest little spots on the front so that I think we will have all that excitement to come. Now, there's a man in the trenches of the First World War talking about excitement, talking about fascinating, watching the, the guns, the thing. These were letters to his mother and father. Now, unfortunately, he was seriously injured, I was, was then um, taken back to Britain and spent time in a hospital and died of his wounds in 1921. And that was of the Watlington family. I'm going to close with a reading from just a very short reading from a Richard Holloway, Leaving Alexandra. I don't know if any of you know this, but it is the most delightful, delightful book. It's a autobiography by Richard Holloway. Now, Richard Holloway was the uh, Bishop of Edinburgh, Epis Episcopal Bishop of Edinburgh. And um, I got to know him through some work we were doing with parenting. And he is a, a, a wonderful, wonderful man. And he said, what's left to say? Only this. When I die, I don't want a stone or a sign left anywhere to mark the fact that I've had a life on earth. Before I went down the stairs to join the unnumbered dead. My name will be written in ink. And ink is the best symbol for a life. Brief defiant, fading. Fellow Caribbeans, I hope, uh, have, have, I've had a lot of fun doing this, and I hope uh, you, you get some, some enjoyment out of this next stage of your journey. Today is now. Tomorrow, what will it bring?
I hope you have an enjoyable coming out of lockdown. And uh, as Dave Allen used to say, may your God go with you. Thank you very much. Hilton, thank you. Um, thank you. you. I'll unmute everybody. Okay. Yeah, and you may have to unmute yourselves to, to comment. Do you want to say a few words? Well, just uh, bef before uh, I thank Eldon formally, I'd just like to ask any anybody who has unmuted themselves, and one or two of you haven't, uh, whether they've got any questions to Eldon so they can clarify their homework. <laughs> <laughs> if you if have... I could it, Elton, yeah. Elton, I have my book already. Ah, uh, there we go. Not, yeah, it's not a comprehensive uh, 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 periodical as you have, but it, it d does does go through chron chronological parts of your life. Oh, and I'm going to make a promise today that I'm going to start filling it in. Um, the first page says I was born in 1951 in Simpson's Maternity Hospital in Edinburgh, and I need to really get up to date because there's about 150 pages to fill in. So you, you give me a bit of enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Is that okay? Good time. Well done. Excellent. Anybody else want to? Uh, I really enjoyed it, Alden. Uh, all the way from Bermuda. And uh, uh, you're a great storyteller. And we um, can't wait till you come back and we sit on our porch and, and have some stories in, in person. Will do. Looking forward to it, Warren. <laughs> right. Uh, well, thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, we did clap, but I not think half of us were unmuted, so I think we might just do it again. Uh, <laughs> but before we do... Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> as they say, as they say, don't applaud, just throw money. <laughs> <laughs> I presume it doesn't work. <laughs> I'd like to thank you for exposing yourself to us. That was very <laughs> brave. Uh, I just got one little thing on the never spoil a story with the facts. I, uh, I lectured at Greenwich in the past to uh, officers about to join their first nuclear submarine on uh, on the basically system, reactor systems and systems supporting the reactor. And I used to use uh, anecdotal evidence for, from my very limited experience at the time of, of uh, a couple of appointments to earlier submarines. And I'd use them basically to illustrate how important a particular piece of equipment was. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you need to know your audience when you do this, because <laughs> I was uh, telling a story, and I cannot remember which piece of equipment it was, to illustrate the very, very great importance of a particular bit, when one of the chaps at the back said, that's not how it happened which kind of completely <laughs> pulled the rug from under me. And he was a, a chap who'd been a, a chief petty officer in the, in the particular incident concerned, uh, who would now come up through the ranks and become an officer. And uh, mm. I, I did say to him afterwards, for goodness sake, don't ever spoil one of my lecture points <laughs> with the bloody truth. What's the matter with you, man? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Eldon. That's right. Good. Uh, we'll move on to next time. Uh, I can't, oh, I've, I failed to look it up. Who's next? It's Bruce, I think. Yes, uh, oh. two weeks' time. Uh, Bruce, right. you want to tell us about what you're, what you're going to talk about? As a historian, there will be absolute truth throughout. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure about that. <laughs> As normal. <laughs> <laughs> that, that will be... Forward to that, Bruce. That will be same time on the 16th of July. I'd just like to warn Tony, though, that there's a possibility, not, not uh, confirmed yet, that I might not be available for that meeting. So, Tony, you may, you may be doing this little rather inept beginning and ending that I produce. Anyway, I'm sure that anybody who can, and maybe many others, when knowing it's the famous Bruce, will... Uh, be listening and watching next time. And again, thank you very much, Eldon. Uh, thank you. <laughs> very inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> and enjoy yourself for a fortnight. Yeah. Well done. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.
Yeah. Okay.